I truly think that what we saw as changes from the printing press and the oil revolution may very well be an understatement of the potential impact that Bitcoin could have on the world when you're looking out 30 to 50 years. And like you said earlier, it's about having patience because we need to make sure that we don't lose what makes this thing so revolutionary. Servus and greetings from Vienna. My name is Anita Posch. Thank you for listening to Bitcoin und Co., my podcast that's introducing the philosophy, ideas and people behind Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Hello, girls and boys, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode 73. Today with Mr. Bitcoin Audible, Guy Swan. Before, I would like to say thank you to the people who wrote recommendations on Apple Podcast, my new patrons, and all of you who have messaged me in the last days. Keep it coming. I like your feedback and ideas. You can send me an email to hello at anitaposch.com or you can visit anita.link forward slash 73, where you will find an audio recorder to send me your questions or feedback. Also, the show notes of my conversation with Guy Swan are on this page. I'm in the middle of changing the show topics a little bit. The philosophy and ideas behind Bitcoin have been covered for 73 episodes now. I will open the space for more wide-ranging topics in which Bitcoin will play a role in the future. Also, I want to cover more stories from people and their real-life uses of Bitcoin. Next week, for instance, I have Dale Beaven on the show, a married father of two who is using only Bitcoin for every single payment since 2017. If you have an interesting story to tell too, please contact me. Today's guest is Guy Swan. He is the host of the Bitcoin Audible podcast, where he is reading Bitcoin articles and essays by different authors. In 2011, Guy Swan found out about Bitcoin. He was using money he didn't have to buy Bitcoin back then, just to watch it losing its value in the following bear market. For him, this was not the moment for an exit. It was the moment when he really started to investigate and learn about Bitcoin. Please enjoy our wide-ranging conversation about Bitcoin. If you like what you hear, please hit the subscribe button in your podcast player now and join other listeners in writing a recommendation on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot to spread the news about the show. Thank you. And now, a word from my sponsors. Local Bitcoins is one of the most trusted and the largest peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin trading platforms in the world. On Local Bitcoins, you can buy and sell your Bitcoin in an easy, fast and secure way, always protected by escrow. Unlike stock-like exchanges, Local Bitcoins allows you to trade with people like you, and you can choose any currency you prefer and find a safe payment method to complete your trade. Local Bitcoins also offers a web wallet, so you can trade and deposit and send out your Bitcoin all in one account. Go to www.localbitcoins.com to buy and sell Bitcoin. Shift Crypto and their Bitbox O2 hardware wallet. I've known the team behind the Bitbox O2 for some time now and I feel we share the same values. We believe in financial independence and that means holding your own keys. We care about making it easy for everyone to keep their Bitcoin safe. The Bitbox O2 is a Swiss-made hardware wallet. It makes it simple to store and use your coins. I especially like that they have a Bitcoin-only edition too, and I can use it directly with my phone. Check out the Bitbox O2 at shiftcrypto.ch. That's S-H-I-F-T-C-R-Y-P-T-O. Ch. You'll get a 10% discount with the code ANITA in the checkout. Not your keys, not your coins, is one of the basic rules in Bitcoin. Therefore, I definitely recommend using a hardware wallet, which is what most crypto experts use. For those who have difficulties with the technical requirements and constant maintenance of hardware wallets, there is the card wallet. 
The Card Wallet is a very simple and secure solution for long-term storage of Bitcoin and Ethereum. No software updates needed and it leaves no traces on the blockchain. You can give it away as a gift or inheritance. You can send Bitcoin to it and all you have to do is to store it in a safe place. The manufacturers are the Austrian State Printing House and Coinfinity, Austria's first Bitcoin broker founded in 2014. Order your card wallet at cardwallet.com forward slash Anita and get 20% off. And finally, a shout out to the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network, where you can find other Bitcoin related podcasts like Proof of Love, Bitcoin Audible, POV Crypto and more. Hello, Guy. Thanks for taking the time to do this interview with me today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm excited. We're going to be talking about Bitcoin. Yeah, that's, that's definitely what we're going to talk about. <laughs> I mean, my, my first question is, what's your connection to Swan Bitcoin? Because actually, I always thought that you might be the founder or something because of your name. But is it <laughs> like that or is this just a coincidence? And it's totally just a coincidence. Um, uh, Corey uh, Clipston and Jan Pritzker are the CEO and co-founder. Uh, they founded it together. And um, uh, they just chose Swan was just the whole idea of the black swan thing. And I didn't get uh, involved until much later. Um, and I'm kind of very loosely involved. Um, I uh, helped them with uh, a lot of their kind of like their podcast outreach and uh, talking and like getting, you know, getting connected with people in the space for a little while. Um, and, uh, but mostly I'm just an advisor. I, uh, you know, help, you know, edit some of the writing or something like that. I do the audio for their give Bitcoin stuff. Mostly I just kind of hang out with them and help where I can help uh, because I want to be part of the project. Um, and they've sponsored the show for a little while and they're always, we're, we're just constantly kind of trading back and forth ways that we can help each other out um, just because they like my project. I like theirs. So that, oh. that's, that's my involvement. Yeah, I understand. You just mentioned, um, your podcast, um, it's called Bitcoin Audible. And yes. I think you started it in early 2018 uh, to read and produce audio episodes from Bitcoin books and articles. Why did you start this? Um, mostly because I wanted it. Um, for a really long time, uh, I was having a, having a hard time trying to figure out where to get time to sit down and like dedicate myself to reading um To some of the best pieces that were out there in Bitcoin. Like I'd always wanted to read shelling out. I'd always wanted to read like there'd be constantly new articles and stuff. And I was such a huge audiobook and podcast listener. I mean, I consume hours and hours of content with that stuff and still do, even though I, my time is a whole lot more limited now that I'm uh, on the other side of the microphone. <laughs> um, but basically for about two or three years, I was just like kind of Like, I wish someone would just turn all these articles into audio so that I could listen to them. So when Nick Carter dropped a new article, I could just listen to it. And I tried a bunch of speech, text-to-speech apps and, like, a bunch of stuff like that. And they were all terrible. Um, and then one day I just kind of broke down. I was like, well, if nobody else is going to do it, I'll just do it. Um, <laughs> and I had been kind of beating around the bush on starting a podcast for, I don't know, somewhere in that same two-year span. And I sat down for the first episode uh, on my bed and read, uh, uh, what was the first one? It was something, I think it was the cryptocurrency ratings on, uh, I think it was like a Coindesk article or something like that. And I just read it into my iPhone and that was the first episode. And then it just kind of went from there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And how did you even get into the space? I mean, when did you hear about Bitcoin the first time? And what did you do before you did the podcast? Um, so before the podcast, I was uh, internet and networking technician. Um, and uh, also kind of bouncing back and forth, I did, uh, I worked at a photography studio and did film projects. Um, so I actually went to school for film uh, and media production. I, I was 
always a nerd. That was kind of the, my favorite side of the film as well as the networking and, uh, troubleshooting side of things. Um, and, uh, so I'd always done like those kinds of things, but I also happened to be, um, a bit of an economics nerd. Uh, and my brother had majored in economics and we were living together and he, basically was having a really hard time coming to terms with a lot of the contradictions that they were teaching him in economics class. And he would kind of debate with his professors. Um, and then he would come home and be like, dude, so this is what they taught us. And then he would re-explain it to me. And then we would try to break through the contradictions. We'd be like, how could, how could A be true if B is true. Like they tell us, you know, both of these things. And so we kind of went down our own little rabbit hole of trying to figure out economics, um, uh, and found Austrian economics. And right at that same time, while I was, you know, deep into film and studying about like BitTorrent and networking and, uh, kind of fascinated with the power and changes that the internet was bringing about. And then we found Austrian economics right at that same time. Uh, and that was just what we were consuming all of our time with. And then out of nowhere, one of my brother's friends just messaged, messaged him on like Facebook or something like that and said, you guys would probably be interested in this thing called Bitcoin. And we were down the rabbit hole immediately. This was in 2011, I think. Um, so nine going on 10 years now, I think it was early 2011. And uh, we were like that night we were we were up all night. Like to, to, I think I remember like we read the white paper, um, and we were just going off about how crazy it was that like, this was literally like an Austrian economic theory codified into an internet protocol. And I mean, just my mind was utterly blown, uh, within the first hours that we were digging into this thing. And I remember that the next morning we were still excited and talking about it and like the sun was coming up and I was like, holy crap. I got to go to sleep. <laughs> um, and that was, that was the start of, uh, both of our journeys. And I have yet to lose my enthusiasm over it. So, uh, it's, it's a pretty strong pull for Bitcoin for me. <laughs> so you didn't lose your enthusiasm as I understood, because that was the question I would ask you now, have asked you now, like 10 years into it, isn't it going to be boring? I would have thought so, but no, um, it's kind of like one of those things like being fascinated with the internet, like 10 years in, it's more exciting rather than less, you know, you're finally seeing things that you knew possible at the beginning come to fruition. Uh, and you know, it's been a long maturation process to get here and we're just finally touching on things that people have been talking about and theorizing about for a really long time, like the lightning network and multiple layers in order to provide like, you know, a retail payments layer that could actually scale to a global system, um, uh, smart contracts, like, like discrete log contracts that you could actually do off chain, but are enforced by an on chain contract and these sorts of things. Like we're finally realizing it's, it's like we had to get through the store of value proposition first as this, you know, there's those stages of monetization and it was never going to be a short run, but it's like, finally we're, We're seeing that, you know, Netflix is around the corner, um, that uh, we're going to have something like YouTube, uh, the equivalent of like, you know, the Internet, like th there was all these possibilities. And in the next 10 years, we're going to actually see them. And I don't think there will ever be anything that. Like, I find it hard to believe that it won't continue to be fascinating. In fact, I bet it picks up. Um, but yeah, not yet, at least <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Yeah, I think so too. But I think which what also will come true might be that we are going to specialize into different directions. You know, like uh, a part of us are working on the Lightning Network more than on Bitcoin base layer at the moment. So, and maybe it also splits up into more and more uh, different disciplines. I I totally agree. Um, I think that's a great way to think about it. Just because, like, you have uh, like right now on the internet you know, 
during the nineties, like you just worked on the internet. Um, then suddenly like in the early two thousands, you have web devs, you have, you know, front end designers, you have app, uh, app developers, like, like it's split up into, you know, 20, 30, 50 different like discourses and, um, uh, specialization, uh, for the work being done. And as Bitcoin expands, I think we're going to see the very same thing. And just like you, t just like you mentioned, we're witnessing it right now. There are people who just work on lightning and don't do Bitcoin development and simultaneously, you know, people who just work on Bitcoin. And I think, I think that's just kind of like a first step microcosm of what this next 10 years is going to be. We're going to realize all the specialization that can occur and the new layers and uh, applications that come about. People are going to specialize in just one because it's going to have, there's just so much potential for all of it. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree. Hmm. And I guess that many people who weren't as patient as those who are working on Bitcoin in the last 10 years went into building uh, like things like altcoins, token stuff, decentralized finance and all those things. But that's all coming into Bitcoin now. I was just reading something about, uh, I think it was, I think it was an article on Coindesk talking about um, someone trying to or basically taking DeFi, like the concepts of DeFi, uh, without the without the making the unnecessary tokens, um, and bringing it to the Lightning Network with like the RGB protocol, I believe mm -hmm. what they were leaning on. Um, so this and, and that's exactly right. Is you're actually starting to see that patience was a virtue, um, and uh, the kind of getting to that area, uh, that point in the maturation phase where like layer two and layer three can bring all of this functionality. Uh, still without uh, bloating or uh, uh, risking the attack surface of layer one. What do you think are the properties that make Bitcoin so unique compared to all the other protocols and coins that came afterwards? Uh, security. We, we like to simplify, um, and, and mostly just because it's that thing which is most in front of us if we don't really dig into what money is. We like to simplify things down to, oh, it's just a medium of exchange. But mediums of exchange are incredibly easy to make. Um, like it's easy to make like a new credit card or a new payment app or like like the that layer of problem is something that we have thousands of networks for and tons of alternatives. Whereas to like I liken it to like in the early 90s is that like we saw that you know Netflix was possible um like internet streaming could have like was going to be there but you know in the 90s like they didn't even people didn't even put graphics on your website because it was going to take hours and hours and hours to load like it you know those old windows classic look um uh the the caveman days of the internet uh but if we had spent all of our resources in 1993 trying to build Netflix, like trying to build internet streaming, it would have been an absolute and utter waste because we had three, four steps of ma massive like infrastructure and maturation to go through before that was even really a possibility. Um, and in, in that same way with Bitcoin, like cultivating And uh, going through the process of making sure that that digital asset is secure, is sustainable for the long term, is about lowering the attack surface. It's about making sure that we get more decentralized, not less. It's about making sure that those trade-offs aren't compromised on. And I think that's what Bitcoin has done. And the, the constant squealing on social media about like, oh, Bitcoin doesn't have enough transactions per second. Every time I hear someone else bring that up, all I can think is that like, well, I know that they are still focused on the wrong thing um, because transactions per second is a, as Parker Lewis says in his Bitcoin is not too slow, is that digital scarcity was a zero to one innovation. Like it was a breakthrough Uh, that's that was an order of magnitude um, a leap from uh, our previous systems and uh, the architecture of the monetary system that we are coming from uh, is basically a complete flipping upside down of the ownership and adjudication model. 
whereas payments are a one to n, like a one to infinity problem. Like you can just constantly increment uh, innovations on payments over and over and over again. So like if lightning in, you know, some rough first level uh, implementation gets us 10 X, well, that's fine because we can figure out some way to improve it by 20% and get 12 bags and then find another improvement that uh, makes liquidity better and multi-path payments that suddenly it's we can double it from there. But it's not something that uh, we're going to like just turn a switch and then we're going to have global payments for infinity for like millions and millions of uh, transactions per second. And then we'll just be done. Like as this becomes more and more useful, as time goes on, we're going to find thousands of different ways to actually do the payments problem. Uh, but the absolute most critical thing that we don't do is risk the underlying asset, risk the its ability to independently and securely store value in a digital space. Because that is something that can be lost. And when that's lost, it doesn't matter what your payment system can do. It doesn't matter how many features or smart contracts you can put on it. You know, like I could write smart contracts to trade dirt, but it doesn't make dirt valuable. Like what the value and the reason that those payments and smart contracts are worth something is because they settle an underlying valuable asset. I think in the historical context, uh, Bitcoin is one of the most important inventions and um, I see it also as an evolution of money. Yeah. And you definitely know the article by Tour de Mester about the Bitcoin reformation. Oh, yeah. And where he compares it to the developments before and while the Dutch reformation in the 16th century. I had him on the show in episode 57 where he describes the parallels between the Protestant revolution and today, like the Catholic Church as a rent-seeking monopoly, like the central banks today, or the emergence of book printing compared to the communication possibilities over the internet. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I definitely think I love the historical analogies and Tur is uh, great for digging specifically into those um, uh, just because I think he was actually responsible for the the huge analogy or the, the exploration of the analogies to like the oil revolution um, and uh, like moving away from uh, like whale oils and stuff like that into like kerosene and gasoline. Um, And uh, I thought that was a really great uh, parallel as well. And the the Reformation and uh, the printing press, I think that's that's one of the things that so many of these groundbreaking uh, technologies that have truly changed the cost dynamics of information, uh, communication, and uh, energy. Um, the like, like you look at oil and oil was a huge was a vast breakthrough again an order of magnitude leap from what came before it and you can see that just in uh, just in like the cost of lighting over the period of like adoption like in 1870 it would a, a minute's worth of a person's labor would buy you um uh what was it i think it was like three minutes or four minutes of oil to 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 have a lamp um and you know the the world was dark when it went dark when the sun went down the world was dark because light was an incredibly costly thing to have it was a luxury um and uh i think it was like 1950 so 80 years later we go through the industrial revolution we we go through oil we we have automobiles like like we see this huge process and at the other end of that a minute's worth of labor will buy you seven hours from four minutes or three minutes whatever it was to seven hours of an incandescent light bulb and it just It, it was an energy revolution. And you see the exact same thing in uh, the printing press as a communication revolution. And that undermined that undermined the authority structures of the day because uh, education, like to knowledge, was a walled garden. You went to an authority to figure out what 
the Lord knew to be true. Like the the church and the authorities, it was such a privilege to have access to information that they controlled it. And they didn't want to share it just because of that high cost. And it allowed them to basically have power over other people, to control other people. And when the printing press dropped that cost by 90%, by just like just huge, the, the, the ability to copy, to basically get rid of the, the idea of a scribe. You didn't have to you didn't have to hire someone to write something like it turned it into an automated like machine process. It brought the cost of that down so low that um, that suddenly information and knowledge was open to exploration, was open to competition with anybody and literacy rates during that century. Um, he talks about this. Uh, he brings this up in the article. I think it was from. What's what's what was the century? Was it fifteen to sixteen hundred, or was it uh, sixteen to seventeen? Was maybe it 16 I don't to know. Seventeen. I think I get. I think I constantly get mixed up between the using of the fifteenth century and the sixteenth century. Like thinking fifteen hundreds to sixteen hundreds, mm -hmm. whatever that that century. Um, uh, uh, the literacy rate went from like under ten percent to over eighty percent. Um, like it was just a it was a you know night and day flip over a hundred year like maturation phase of just spreading this knowledge and information out to everyone. And it took down some of the greatest power structures in society. It mm. completely changed the, the map of the world uh, as a communications tool. And now to think that Bitcoin is a monetary tool, a communications tool, and one that has the potential to revol revolutionize energy. Like, Bitcoin is all three, like has a, has aspects of all three of those, and it's in an entirely new digital environment. Don't build Netflix in 1993. Wait for Netflix to come. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. And I could imagine the numbers you said about the literacy. You know, like from 10 to 80 percent. I could imagine that something like that happens with uh, the access to financial services, like all yeah. those. The billions of people who do not have access to a banking account or to can can save money in any way to money as a technology, this could really like make boom, you know, and and all those people suddenly can communicate um, with money. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge and and I think, God, the 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 potential there to just have someone able to save money for mm -hmm. the number of people who don't have access to that. Um, and also just the, like when, when you're looking at like lightning services, like, like a, like a breeze wallet or strike or something like that, you start to see, there's a great article I read recently on the show. Um, I cannot remember the author's name. Oh, I hate it. I hate it when I can't remember the author. Um, it's uh, lightning as a global payments network. Um, I think is the title of it, if I'm not mistaken. It's actually the beginning of a series. Um, and uh, uh, he, he breaks down the comparison to the current payment systems, like the current payment networks, to um, uh, Lightning, and just kind of compares the incredibly walled gardens and permission set up, like the huge regulatory hurdles, the the hilarious joke of trying to get a bank li banking license, um, and the just the enormous cost with the onboarding cost of Uh, setting up a lightning service and it it genuinely like the gap between that i think uh in my opinion looks is actually larger than the gap between like the at&t walled garden networks of like the 70s and 80s and the open internet in the 90s to think that anybody could just start a service on the internet was unthinkable in like the 80s Like you had to, you know, you have to call AT&T and like have something implemented nationwide to have a network service available to people. You couldn't like start up a website and offer it to two people. And same with the walled gardens of payment networks and systems right now is that I can't just, I can't just like in my garage, like make a little app and be like, oh yeah, I'll just provide a payment service to my two friends and somebody else. 
Like I have to get a banking, like I'm, I'm breaking like so many laws if I do that. And, uh, the, to try to get like a banking license to actually be able to do that and, uh, like settle those transactions or have like access to the credit card networks, which actually uses an old, uh, coding standard from like the eighties as a means to control, uh, as a means to basically prevent people. Uh, they have such a isolated, uh, code coding base. I can't remember what the actual name of the code is, but n hardly anybody knows how to work with it. And they actually kind of use that as a way to prevent people from like accessing it. Um, uh, but uh, regardless, the lightning network is an open permissionless, uh, payment system. So now I, I kind of have that same freedom. Like I can connect to quote unquote, I can offer a service to anybody in the world. Like as long as you have an internet connection, like the lightning network now makes the barrier to setting up essentially banking and financial services as, as low as it was to set up a website in the nineties. And, and that's going to create such an explosion of available, uh, uh, access to financial services, um, access to a global market as opposed to what your jurisdiction says you're allowed to have. And then to have and own a censorship resistant independent money that can't be, that, that doesn't listen to the capital controls of whoever happens to be in charge today um, and doesn't get debased by the irresponsibility of your, you know, insert political leader here. Like that is going to be groundbreaking for the people who are in the worst situations in the world. And it will, it will start to preserve wealth in so many different aspects that the, the general wealth of the world will, will start to climb at an accelerated pace, because that's one of those things that has its own feedback loop. The, and it, it will, it will start to break out. And, and I think it's going to provide access to so many people and preserve so much wealth that is being bled through inflation and destroyed through political control right now like 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 i said you know go back to the reformation like there i think there's going to be a new renaissance um it's hard to understate uh or excuse me it's hard to overstate uh, the potential of this technology in my opinion i've heard you talk about parallels to the agricultural revolution in another podcast so the time when humankind stopped being hunters and gatherers and settled down And um, where, where do you see the parallels to that time now? What can Bitcoin enable? Like the agricultural revolution was essentially the period of time where humanity went from not being able to preserve capital to being able to preserve capital. Like, like prior, to, prior to those centuries or that, actually, I guess it's like kind of a 5,000 year tr uh, uh, trend there. That one was a very slow revolution. Um, but uh, a revolution nonetheless um, was that, you know, prior to that, there was no reason, there was no benefit to accumulating a lot of wealth. Like you had to carry your wealth on your person. So to have all of this excess and to actually have something to invest in time and productivity to, you know, make your life a whole lot better, it didn't pay off because you lost it as soon as the herd moved away. Or as soon as the seasons changed, you had to drop it and you had to go off to the, the, the new area or the new place and set life. You had to start over constantly. Um, and the agricultural revolution, which funny, there was actually one thing that I read that uh, suspected that one of the reasons we actually invented um, one of the very first uh, inclinations to start farming may have actually been to create beer and get drunk, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I thought was hilarious, but there's actually pretty decent evidence of it. Um, but uh, nonetheless, we figured out how to grow food uh, or cultivate our own food. And it allowed us to set up shop. It allowed us yeah, to I sit mean, down I mean, in many, <laughs> sorry, in many countries, beer is food. <laughs> <laughs> very yeah. true, very true. Very long human tradition. Yeah. Um, But uh, it allowed us to start accumulating wealth and it completely, I mean, it led to the birth of civilization um, and it le also led to the emergence of money because, uh, which actually those are dependent on each other, money 
it may have been that the ability to accumulate wealth led to the emergence of money and then money created the uh, or allowed the emergence of society and civilization. Uh, and suddenly we had cities. Suddenly we had suddenly we built things that lasted hundreds of years. Uh, suddenly our our time preference, our, our view of uh, what it meant to produce like like trade, like mercantilism, like like it's suddenly it, suddenly the whole the whole world opened up. The, the possibilities and the scope of reality changed dramatically. Um, and I think we're going to see a very similar thing. Uh, with Bitcoin, because this is this, I think, is kind of that final piece of the puzzle that's pushing us wholly into the digital age, um, because there's always been significant limitation in the potential the potential benefits of the Internet. And in fact, the drawbacks of it um, because of the level of control, the loss of privacy and uh, uh, the, the the lack of control that we have over our environment in the digital space, I think a lot of that is because of the lack of digital money, um, and the 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 fact that all of our money went from we actually went from decentralized gold in the early mid well I guess throughout the 1800s really um, to a fully virtual money. Um, first, it came with banknotes, but competitive banknotes weren't really a problem because those were at least limited to uh, the the trust or the reliability of the institution that issued those notes. So there was still competition, and one bank would fail, but it wouldn't systemically destroy the currency. It wouldn't. It, it didn't risk gold. So we went from a decentralized system to one that ended up going full uh, control into a single monopolic. Mono, no, monopolistic institution um and suddenly suddenly we completely lost sound money um that suddenly it was just up to them and there was there was no quote-unquote monetary policy it was just which leader wanted to do what and what level of restraint they had over their own power uh which is you know basically a guaranteed slim to none um and going into the digital age it just made that worse because there is no, it essentially meant that there is no ownership without someone else's permission. Nothing of value in the digital world is owned without an authority saying you own it. It's always just up the ladder of who, who agrees with you as to whether or not you own it. There's always some third party who is in charge of that account. There is always some central bank that says that that bank has the right to say who owns what account. Like, like it was authority all the way up the tree or all the way up the pyramid. Um, and that was inherent to the digital space. You couldn't do it any other way because there was nothing native to the internet that was valuable. Like the information itself was free because as soon as you had information on the internet, it was infinitely uh, uh, replicable. You could, you could copy it a billion times. Um, and and when you when you finally introduce value, when you finally introduce digital scarcity, I think it will change the whole dynamic. I think we'll see monetization like models change. I think the freemium model will start to uh, fall away in the not in the sense that you won't like get a lot of the content for free, but in the sense that you're the cust like that you're the one being sold like uh, like. Facebook or whatever sells your information. That's how they make money. They basically control your environment, spy on you, uh, suck as much data out of you as they can, and then they sell it. I think that is a consequence of the authoritative structures and the fact that there was no simple, low-cost way to uh, implement payment systems on the internet. Um, you had to go with a walled garden. You had to go with an authority um, and competition was incredibly limited. Everybody had a banking license, you know, blah, 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 all that, all the mess that comes with uh, an authoritative structure. Um, and now that that is finally being undermined, now that we finally have real value in the digital space um, and we can build open source permissionless payment systems and contract systems and ownership systems on top of this, uh, I think it is going to change all of the models that we're used to on the internet um, and open up 
access to so many things that just didn't quite work before. That we had a bunch of beautiful ideas about mesh networks and decentralized file sharing and uh, 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 file storage and like all of these things that just never had the money to make them possible now become possible in a whole new way. Um, and I'm crazy excited to see what develops in that in the next 10 to 20 years. Don't you think that uh, over-regulation or re regulation in general may lead us back to like the way in the 90s from the hopes that what the open internet will bring and now we have big monopolies like Facebook, Google and co. Is there not the danger that we get the same things in, in Bitcoin, in the Bitcoin space? Yes and no. Um, I think... Like, I still think that, like, go, go back to the utopian dreams of the internet of decentralized open network. And in a sense, we got the benefits of a lot of those things. Like, we did get a massive push toward decentralization, um, even though we managed to find ourselves in a sp space with so many huge uh, monopolies and companies with a lot, a, a vast degree of control still compare it to what what we had access to in the late 80s um the narrative was there were there were three channels like like that was the access to to media to information mm -hmm. and today yes facebook controls what we see yes twitter censors uh opinions that we don't agree with yes google uh, uh fudges with search results um but we also have telegram chats where information Some people don't want others to see gets out. We also have texting. We also have, uh, I mean, we, we, we literally have so many alternative avenues that the lack of cohesion between them, like I think we're seeing like the political discourse today is an expression of just how much impact the decentralization of the internet has had. Um, all of its caveats aside, It has led to the access to so many new narratives. Whereas prior to that, in the 80s, like there was like one comfortable lie that everybody believed about, th about mm -hmm. reality, about the world. And that has, breaking, that has broken down. And now we are chasing hundreds of different narratives, thousands of different narratives in every possible way. Every individual community is coming up with their own view of the world. And now we're all clashing. We're having this huge identity crisis. And in that, the people who feel like we're losing control, that we're losing cohesion, are trying to re-implement it. But the information is too far spread and still too hard to control, even with the seeming, uh, the, the, the sense of... Uh, godlike powers that we think people like like the Google institution has or Facebook or whatever. It's not that great when you think about it. We still have so much access to alternative information streams. I think it's a process of two steps forward, one step back. And Bitcoin is a great example of the next two steps forward. Like we got the internet and we had this explosion in access to information. We went two steps forward. We utterly changed the, the model of access to information and how we communicate with each other um, and how many different conversations we can have. I mean, this, this conversation is a great one. I don't know in any other sense without the internet, how you and I would have gotten together and had a conversation. <laughs> um, and Uh, but then we have one step back. It gets re-centralized. They try to close it off. Um, and everywhere that there is a limitation or an attack vector, it's taken advantage of. But then you have another breakthrough. You have a new layer that presents a new uh, sort of decentralization. You finally solve. I mean, money, the control over money is such a critical source of how that control is actually enabled. Um, in the space um, and how uh, pressure is applied to certain companies and applied, uh, applied by political institutions and, you know, shadow governments. Um, money is a huge tool for, for control. And to see that decentralized, we're, we're moving out of that hierarchical system. I think Bitcoin is uh, another two steps forward. And yes, I think we will get a one step back. 
you know, it's th- these things happen in cycles, but I think the overall trend is toward, uh, it's a huge technological deflation trend towards more wealth, uh, more decentralization, uh, more communication, uh, more open communication and permissionless innovation. And I think despite all of the bad that has come with the internet and all of the controls, uh, we have clearly moved in that direction uh, on net. Like the general direction is absolutely to- more towards that. And we've just seen a, you know, the rocket goes high in the sky and, you know, it, it, it falls back a little bit. <laughs> you know, like there's, there's, always, there's always a bit of a, um, consolidation period, uh, before, before we have a new move. Um, and I think that's kind of the trend of technology. Mm. Talking about, about identity crisis and rockets going up and down. Um, (laughs) (laughs) since you're into the space since 2011, you have lived through, uh, a number of bull and bear markets. Um, yeah. How did this influence your mind and your psyche? I mean, how does one cope with that? Uh, it kind of goes into the background. Um, I, it was so chaotic um, towards the beginning of Bitcoin's life. And uh, it was it was hard to deal with then. Like there was a lot of, and, and everybody, everybody you said you're talked to Bitcoin about was like, oh, you poor stupid child. Um, like, <laughs> like that was the, that was the general uh, expression on people's faces when you talked about Bitcoin in 2012 and 2013 period. Um, like it was a sad joke and you were a sad little person for being even slightly entertained or, uh, interested in it. Um, so I kind of got through the worst of it in the first couple of years I was here. Um, and then, uh, and I remember, like, I kind of got that benefit right at the beginning because I got in on one of those very first run-ups and just had my my ass handed to me. Um, I I invested all of my savings, which was nothing at the time. It was it's sad looking back on it now, but I was I was dead broke. Both both me and my brother were uh, uh, living in a place that we were getting for dirt cheap and still like we would have the power cut off. I mean, uh, the water cut off on us a couple of times. I actually think we did have the power cut off on us. I'm um, trying to meet our bills. Um, and, uh, uh, I was trying to run my own media business, which was a joke. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I, I made good, I edited good movies, but you know, this, <laughs> that, that doesn't mean that I know how to price things. I know how to get my production line working and efficient. Um, all I could do was edit. Um, and uh, I, so we invested money that we didn't have literally <laughs> at the very peak of one of those first bubbles, um, like right when it went to like $30. And it had, it had climbed from like 10 cents. And I had been FOMOing in just as hard as I could go. And it went from $30 all the way back down to like a buck something. It was like a buck 75 or something like that. And this was, again, like we're trying to meet bills. We're poor. And I just watched my first, I was so excited about having found this new technology. And I was, this was my first foray into investing and I just got obliterated, like utterly obliterated. I watched in a period of a couple of months, basically 95% of the only money that I had just disappear into nothing. <laughs> and I was just, I was, I was just like, holy God, I'm such an idiot. What have I done? Um, I, I realized I didn't really know anything about Bitcoin. There wasn't even anything to read. You know, there was the white paper and a couple of forums. Like I read some conversations on the Bitcoin talk forums. I couldn't read code, you know. So I was actually investing in this vague idea of this utopian dream that I thought was going to be possible. And after it plummeted down to nothing, I decided I made a I made a decision with myself. Um, I remember, you know, throwing up one day uh, about having lost all my money. Um, and I was like, okay, so I got in on this 
ignorantly. I, I got on this um, like a vague idea of what the hell I was investing in and not really knowing what I'm doing. I'm not going to sell under those same conditions. I'm going to read and I'm going to explore and I'm going to find everything I can about Bitcoin and I'm going to see, am I just early? Is this something that truly does have the potential that I think it does? Um, or did I just make the dumbest investment of my life? Am I just a, a complete idiot? And so I started reading and uh, I, I, the, the more and more I dug, the more fascinating and the more intricate and nuanced the protocol was, and the more I saw just how that game theory could last sustainably into the future and how mining might shift and how it could push like into entirely new industri industries. Like, it just got more and more interesting as to all of the ways that this could actually affect things. And I decided not to sell. I decided like, the more, the more I dug into this, the more promising it looked. And I was like, other people just don't understand. Um, they're just not seeing the value of this thing. And, you know, when they, when they contest it, they don't contest it with knowledge. They don't contest it with real information. They just tell me I'm stupid and they haven't read the white paper. They don't know how the thing works. So I, I felt confident and uh, like I really had discovered something. And then since then, we've gone through another three hype cycles mm. and not one of them was even close to as hard as the first one. Like I got my bear market badge very, very early and everything got progressively easier and easier. And now it's just like I hear the exact same arguments. Oh, Bitcoin can't scale for payments. Oh, there's going to be a mining death spiral after the halving. And I'm like, I've done this three times and we're on we're on number four like this is as sure a bet as it's ever been and i don't even like when the price drops i fomo to buy um <laughs> like like my level of confidence has only gotten higher and higher um and now it just seemed like seems like a breeze um in comparison to what it was in those early days everything was chaos there would be a hack and it would be it would be the whole Bitcoin ecosystem had just blown up. Everything was on fire and there was no coming back from it over and over and over again. Like, I mean, just constantly um, like everything was world shattering disaster during those early days. And you thought that maybe this thing dies and it just consistently didn't. Um, and its problems today just seem like pebbles uh, <laughs> in mm -hmm. comparison. So. That's kind of <laughs> being early has definitely made it easy, easier, not harder. This is a question I stole from Tim Ferriss podcast, um, where he asks <laughs> <laughs> if you had the possibility to put a short sentence on a giant billboard for all people to see, what would it say? And I'm adopting this question today for to match today's situation and ask if I would buy you a big ad on all social networks, what would it say? Huh? Oh, that's a good question. Probably something, probably something like, do you really know what money is? <laughs> and then hashtag Bitcoin. Like I would just try to, cause, cause the journey to understanding Bitcoin is not, it's a very slow and deliberate journey. Like they call it falling down the rabbit hole because it feels endless. Um, and there's no shortcut, but I think the question that leads more people there than anything else and more people in the right direction to really dig in and understand what Bitcoin is and what kind of an innovation it is, is the question is, what is money? Is why do we use the paper we use? What is gold? What's the history of this thing? I think that's the most important aspect of this that is lost on so many um, so don't know if that would be a good ad, but that would be the question I would ask that I would hope would catch someone's attention and kind of plant a seed for them to start their trip down the rabbit hole. Mm, I agree completely on this question. Yeah. So we're coming to an end now. 
You have read so many articles and books about Bitcoin. What are your recommendations? How can pe can people filter through these mm -hmm. masses of information and choose the best content? Oh, yeah, that's a that's a many year process of kind of getting down my own process of uh, mm. uh, uh, filtering through things. Um, as far as things that I have read on the show, you mentioned the Bitcoin Reformation. I love that one. Uh, that's a great one. Uh, there is uh, uh, the entire Gradually Then Suddenly series by Parker Lewis. That's, I think, 13 different pieces, um, uh, which you can actually just get that at unchained-capital.com. Their blog over there, they actually link to all the audio versions of it um, uh, for my podcast. Um, and I actually have been meaning to, I think somebody created a Spotify playlist for those. Um, I'll try to remember to get that link. Um, I should definitely have that available somewhere. Um, that's a really great series, though, that hits on so many major topics. Shelling Out by Nick Zabo is one of those quintessential pieces that I think uh, just on the origins of money, uh, it hits so many of those core concepts that really get at the heart of what money is. Um, uh, Zabo's, that that piece is just excellent. I have a bunch of other great works from him too. I think I have like eight or nine from him. Um, and then a really good recent one is Masters and Slaves of Money by Robert Breedlove. And that one was just amazing. Uh, all of those though are excellent ones to start kind of a journey into for Uh, some of those, uh, some of those core uh, concepts that start to enlighten all of the other stuff that you hear about constantly, and uh, are great prerequisites to all the other uh, fantastic reads out there. Um, but honestly, if you were thinking about any piece that uh, uh, you were wanting to get to, the bullish case for Bitcoin by VJ uh, Boyapati. Um, bunch of great pieces on the Lightning Network. Bunch of places, a bunch of them by Bitcoin Magazine. I've done tons and tons from that website. If there's a good one that you hadn't gotten an opportunity to read, I probably have it on the show. Um, we're at <laughs> 430 reads wow. now. Um, and uh, if it's not on there, shoot me a message. Send me a link. <laughs> Um, I can probably get it out pretty soon if it's if it's really good when we want to have an audible version of it. So that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks for the links. I will put all of them in the show notes. And where can people follow you and your work? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so you can find me at uh, the podcast tag, uh, which is uh, rather new, um, is at Bitcoin Audible. Um, but I, you can find me on Twitter at the crypto economy, um, cause it's a uh, part of the crypto economy network. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm Guy Swan. I do the podcast. I do some, uh, guys take like solo episodes, breaking down some of these concepts. And I also have a YouTube channel, which is at the crypto economy as, uh, as well, or Guy Swan. If you search either of those, you can find me. Um, but yeah. Super. Thank you very much and thank you for your time. This was, uh, I think, a very informative and uh, great episode. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And a uh, big fan of the show, Anita. Uh, it's awesome to actually be on and talk to you. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me on. This is, this is fun. I've uh, been wanting to chat with you for quite some time now. <laughs> thank you. You're very much welcome and have a good day. Thank you. You too. Take it easy. That's it for today. If you like my show, please share it with your friends and hit the subscribe button in your podcast player now. Thanks to my sponsors who make it possible that I can produce the show. Localbitcoins.com, Shift Crypto with the Bitbox O2 and Coinfinity with their card wallet. Music. Start with yes, delicate beats. Idea, content and production. Yours truly, Anita Posch. 